Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron LeGrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another TheMentorPodcast.com uh, with David Randolph again, which this will be his second trip here because we didn't have enough time to complete the first trip. Uh, welcome back, sir. Well, thank you, Ron. I'm glad to be back. Uh, we are talking about short sales. And uh, everybody knows the word short sales. I find that not everybody understands what it really is and how it works. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there about it as well. I know there have been certain times in my career when it was on fire. It was the hottest thing going, short sales. Uh, not so lately, but uh, according to you, they are still a very valid way to make a ton of money in real estate. So we explained the process the last time. So what I want to dig deep into today is how the banks determine how much they uh, will take and how would we have any idea uh, what the bank will do and what the bank won't do. Well, I guess we won't until we actually use them. But uh, tell us what you know about that. That um, that you'd have to be deep into the business to understand uh, like you are. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you know, we talked about, you know, there's, you know, now actually this just came out a couple of days ago, Ron, 1.874 million delinquent loans in this country. Wow. And it's growing because what happened was we knew about the forbearance uh, and the pandemic mm -hmm. junk that went on and people stopped making their payment. So there's all those backlog of people but then this inflation thing came along uh, there, and then the new people stopped making their payments. So, so now we got more people in the 30-day late category. So it's actually getting worse. And so, you know, those loans are owed many, many months of back payments. And so when you get to the bank having a payoff figure, you can't make that. You can't you know, uh, the house isn't going to appraise for that because all the missed interest payments and stuff. So now the bank's going to have to take a, a a loss on that. And that and that's OK for them because they're big boys and they're in a business and they made mistakes and they have to live with it. Right. It's not our problem as investors. And so what will they take for that payoff? So if they're owed two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, you know, what's the criteria and so each lender then, that, and so getting back to your question then, is each lender has a different loan type. So we'll just kind of run through a couple of the major loan types, and then each one will have its own different criteria. And we'll kind of maybe reveal those secrets here on, on your podcast, <clears throat> assuming that we don't get shut down. If the lights go out, we'll know that they, they're on onto us here, right? If the power comes, shuts us down. But, you know, we'll, hopefully we'll still both be here uh, when we talk about this. But basically, the first major type of lender is FHA. You know, and we've <clears throat> many, many people get FHA loans. It's kind of ironic, Ron, when you think about an FHA loan, you know, they only put down 3%, right? You know? Three and a half. Yeah, yeah, three and a half. So how much is a normal real estate commission? Six percent. Exactly. So the minute they bought the home, it's underwater, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. By definition. Uh, yeah. And so, so therefore, um, FHA is very, very careful about how they execute their short sales. And so, and 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 the process of the short sale, they're careful in how the process takes place. And so, they basically are going to make the homeowner, the seller, uh, the borrower go through a waterfall process first. So before you can do a short sale, a lot of people make this mistake. They they just turn in short sale paperwork, but you have to ask the homeowner, have you done a loan modification first? And so they have to try and fail at that first. And so a lot of people will try to stop the foreclosure date. They'll submit paperwork for a short sale. It will get rejected because they didn't ask the question about, did you do a loan modification? And now you don't have time to stop the foreclosure. So that's a little trick here, a little tip that I give to people here is ask the homeowner about the, the loan modification. So, so in a loan modification, if that fails, we move to the short sale. Now, in that case, 
what will the bank accept for that? So they're so careful, Ron, that they're the uh, that they're kind of I don't say the only lender, but but basically they're the lender that sends out an appraiser to the house. Okay, the appraiser does a real full FHA guideline appraisal. Now that may sound normal to you, right? I mean, but in reality, that's not the normal case in other types of lenders that we'll talk about in, during the 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 talk in the podcast here. Uh, those other lenders are just doing a what's called a BPO, uh, you know, broker price opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's basically uh, I, I I don't want to call them untrained, but they're realtors, okay, yeah. uh, determining the value. They they don't have an appraisal license, so FHA is different. They send a full license appraiser out. All right, stop for a minute. Let's catch up. You're telling me that on FHA loans. If they haven't done a loan modification application, then they will not short sale. Exactly. All right. So I need to know if it's an FHA loan and if they've done one. So if they have not done one, then FHA is going to force them to go through one. But that would stop the foreclosure, would it not? Yes, you can stop the foreclosure with that. Gosh knows how long that's going to take. Uh, So that would slow down the process, but not necessarily kill the process. what if they? Most of them are not going to qualify for a loan uh, for a loan modification anyway, are they? No, they no, only only three percent do. Oh, so so the FHA <laughs> wants it done and wants to spend the money on appraisal. Odds are against them. So then we just let them go through, and then when it can, they don't get qualified, then we start the short sale. Yes, exactly. I want to make it clear that's on FHA loans only now. So yes. you need to know that when you're in the seller's house or when you're talking to the seller and asking them. What about VA? Yeah, no, VA, um, you know, they'll do a, uh, they, they will let them go straight to a short sale. Okay. Now, of course, in all cases, Ron, you you, you got to ask the homeowner, what are you wanting to do? Is it, you know, are you wanting to stay in the house forever? Okay. And, and that's okay, Ron. When we're talking to the homeowner, uh, you know, we want, have to do what they want. And so if they think that they can keep the house, then we have to help them try to do a loan mod that they'll fail at. Well, what happens when they fail? There you are, you're right in their face, helping them all along and say, well, now you're going to have to do a short sale. And guess what? I'm that buyer for you. And so I can now do that short sale and keep you out of uh, foreclosure. So so we can always ask the lender to do the modification, but it's not required with VA. Okay. And the problem with both FHA and VA, if they've been only been in a house a year or two, there is no, maybe, might be equity depending on where to live and how fast it went up, but um, it can't be much. But that's okay with me because I like properties with small equities and good loans on them because they're easy to take over to sellers that want just wants debt relief. And uh, of course, my goal is not to sell a house right away, but to lease option it out in a nice big multi-thousand dollar non-refundable option deposit and just let it sit there and the golden goose keep laying the golden eggs for years and years and years. And then the debt is constantly being paid down and hopefully uh, the, the value is increasing and there's going to be a monthly cash flow for putting a tenant buyer in it. And when we put tenant buyers in the houses, they, they, they're they responsible for 100% of the repairs. So nobody calls us to, to unplug a toilet. So I, I guess it all depends on the investor's uh, mindset and business strategy. Um, uh, in fact, I'm just buying. I'm buying one this week with uh, uh, almost no equity in it, but I'm taking over a low interest loan and it's a nice house, nice area. I don't care what do we got to lose. So um, uh, that's the FHA and VA. Now, uh, what about uh, conventional loans and maybe USDA as well? Because you might run across some of those out there. Well, yeah, I mean, you you've got um, the. Now, probably the the second biggest category is actually Fannie Mae. So you got FHA um, and you got VA, and then you got uh, Fannie Mae, uh, and then you got USDA, really, really, really tiny, small part. Uh, then you got conventional loans. Mm-hmm. Now it's interesting, Ron, on conventional loans, they don't really have any set rules. Okay, so for example, uh, on a conventional loan, they might do both an appraisal and a BPO, or they might just do a BPO. And it's very specific to who the lender was behind that, the the investors behind it. So as you know, all banks are just servicing companies, 
right? And so it's the the actual what's backed up behind that. Who are the investors that provided the money? In a conventional loan, um, that it could be it could be me. Uh, I could have been funding a loan, right? I know you know I do hard money lending, and so but conventional loan could potentially be a set of investors that you know they have their own criteria. So those are really neat, Ron, because a lot of times. Uh, you know, they'll just do a BPO, which is very inaccurate by definition. And then on top of that, Ron, they may take 70%, 50% of it. They're not taking the uh, BPO amount. None of them, Ron, we, we, we scheduled this whole podcast so I can give you secret percentages because none of them take the appraisal amount. So let's go back to FHA. And that's then so for people who got pencil and paper right now, if you're in the car driving, pull over, okay, get your pencil and paper out because on FHA, yes, they do a full appraisal and that sucks. That's bad because full appraisal means that they're going to do a lot of analysis and a lot of details to that, okay? And so what happens is they determine a value uh, that's usually, you know, uh, a number that is not as good as if it was another lender type. But anyway, whatever that appraisal is, the 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 bank will take 88% of that, okay? Hmm. 88%. Now, Ron, if you wait 30 days, okay, so just hang on to it. Don't turn in a purchase sale contract yet. You wait 30 days, they will take 86% of the appraisal, okay? Wait another 30 days, so a total of 60 days. FHA will take 84% of the appraisal amount. That's pretty good. So if you can get the appraisal low, and then you're going to be able to get 84% of that, okay? Conventional doesn't have those numbers, Ron. They may take 70, 60, 50%. It depends on how many loans are non-performing, okay? See, this is not about, everyone thinks that you, that, the, the, the everyone thinks that short sales are dependent upon the value of the house and whether it's underwater. That has nothing to do with it, Ron. To do a short sale, like we talked about in the first episode, if they've missed one house payment, you can do a short sale. It doesn't matter that they're underwater. The second question is the one that you ask them all the time. Okay, you know, basically, which is, you know, are are they, you know, wanting to keep the house, they're wanting to sell the house, and are they willing to, you know do this as a short sale. So in other words, you take over their loans from people that don't want to do a short sale. That's a great strategy. But if the homeowner says, I don't care about this loan, okay, then I can negotiate to buy the house in St. Peter's, Missouri for $29,600. The loan was $196,000. I could have taken over that loan, but I didn't want to when the homeowner said, I don't care I've already missed payments. My credit's already bad. Um, I've already got a deficiency. Would you please, you know, go ahead and do a short sale? And so I convinced the bank, working with them in conjunction, to buy it for $29,600. I could have taken over the loan, but I'd rather generate instant equity, okay, in that particular case. Because when you take them over, you want equity too, right? You know? But man, you know, a couple of points here, Dave, that we're skipping over. Uh, number one, we don't want to take title to the house and then try to go short sale it because the lender will definitely figure that out pretty quick. Uh, and remember that the whole goal here is, is to keep the homeowner in the house as far as the well, lenders are concerned, but we're not going to keep the homeowners in the house. Okay, I'm either going to buy the house or I'm not, or I'm out of here. I'm not interested in doing all the work for nothing myself. But the you know bank gets wind of that you're going to have an issue, right? Yeah, no, absolutely right, Ron. Absolutely, and, and I think in the first podcast we talked about that it is actually against federal law to do a short sale and let the homeowner stay in the house or to rent the house to sell it back or rent it back is a federal law, yeah. and so the homeowners go, and that's and that's what I'm kind of saying is the homeowners are willing to go, okay? Then you can try and do a short sale, okay? Uh, even if it has equity. I know this is a very strange concept, but you can do the short sale when it might have equity. And that's because the FHA will take 84% of that amount that's appraised. Conventionally, about, they take 50%. What, what about if the house is vacant? So with 
FHA, if it's been vacant more than 39 months, then they don't want to do a short sale. So so if if it's been vacant, there's two ways that you do that is, you know, you ask them, well, why is it vacant? And they usually say, well, because the roof is leaking, the basement's leaking, or, you know, had to move out and stuff like that. So basically, you know, they probably moved out for health reasons. Okay. So if you let the FHA know, look, you know, we had to move out because of health reasons, you know, and stuff like that. So, so if it's vacant, that's kind of good for, for us because then we don't have to get them out later. Right. You know, uh, and stuff, you, you you always got this thing, I'm buying your house, but you need to leave. Yeah. But will the bank negotiate on a short sale if they know the house is vacant? Yes, absolutely. Unless it's been more than 39 months vacant. Okay. Yeah. They will do a short sale. I know that. But I would, actually, I was thinking about a loan mod, which I'm sure they won't do if the house is vacant. Correct? Correct. They'll fail that. And, and so and, and so that is a very quick, fast step. You so know. I find it and it's vacant. And then um, the bank probably doesn't even know it. Then why even go through a loan modification if they, we know they're going to get turned down? Because it's a government institution with a policy to follow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bureaucracy. All right. So um, let's talk about houses that need substantial repairs and are way behind, which, of course, is going to drive that BPO way, way, way down. And I got to tell you from experience, <laughs> BPOs are fake news. <laughs> I don't know where they get their numbers from, but I do know this. The, the worse the house smells, the lower the BPA, BPO is going to be. Exactly. And then on top of that, Ron, you're getting a percentage of that. Uh, so, for example, um, if you're doing a, a Fannie Mae loan, they will take 84.01%. So write that number down on a Fannie Mae loan. Uh, which of is, what? Of the BPO? Uh, of the BPO, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So So you got a house that needs a lot of work. BPO comes in really low. That's not what you're offering. That's don't make that mistake. You're not yeah. making your purchase contract for for what that BPO was. You're, no. you're in it for eight point eight four zero one eighty four point zero one percent on Fannie Mae. So um, you know, I have had a lot of BPOs done, and some of them were just so low it was ridiculous, and I you know glad they came in low, but then some of them were way too high. Um, so the ones that are too high. Uh, is there any chance of getting the bank to um, take less than that of the BPO? I mean, I mean, I know they have to sooner or later if nobody buys the house because they're asking too much. But yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Um, so in the short sale process, one of the things we do is dispute. You can dispute that, and each bank, each lender has a form, a format for you to say, no, nah, no, 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 no. There's no way, no way. This is wrong. And so you can get a copy of that BPO and then you look at it and you say, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And so then you can go back to the bank and say, look, look at this data. You know, um, you know, he said that the repairs were five dollars uh, and the repairs are really 20 grand. And so you can then give them a repair estimate. And so you can do a dispute with the bank. It's not over with at all. And then a neat little trick here is this, um, you know, is that you can let the BPO expire. Okay. So you can let that BPO valuation be um, not, um, you know, um, it's it, it basically expires. It's been too long. So you can wait four months. Uh, VA uh, is, uh, you know, some of them are six months, so you might have to wait six months. Okay, so the, you know, these short sales, you know, they're not called fast sales, right? You know, they're called slow sales, okay, and stuff like that. But, but you know, I don't know. You know, you mail letters out to people and and you talk to them, and then maybe they call you back six months later to to sell you their house. I mean, you know, they're not always that fast, and so this is not fast either. So another negotiation technique is just to sit back and just just wait for the you know wait for the bpo to expire and then call for another one and let's try it again with a new guy at the house yeah but by that time the house could be gone on foreclosure well and yes you have to stop that foreclosure date and that's actually man we could do a whole podcast there's there's like 17 techniques to stop a foreclosure date um and actually it's kind of uh, interesting um, you know, 
while you know you are buying houses and taking over the loan and then you know putting somebody in uh you can't do that ron if that homeowner had a foreclosure date you got to move pretty quick but here's what's happened ron in in doing my short sales um is that um i have the ability through 17 different ways to stop the foreclosure date. So guess what happens when I stop that foreclosure date for the homeowner? The homeowner likes me and doesn't like you because you didn't stop the foreclosure date. Now, at that point, they'll let me take over the loan, just like you want to do. But see, Ron, if you can't stop the foreclosure date, no, you're in trouble. It doesn't do any good. You know, you can't take over a loan if the bank takes it back. True, but you can't take over the loan anyway unless you've got an exit strategy or two lined up because you're still going to lose it at the courthouse uh, auction. What if, I, I had a question. Um, oh, crap. Go ahead. I'll think of it. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, it's, you know, I'm just, you know, trying to say that, um, you know, when people are behind that before closure date, you know, the priority, even on the telephone with them, isn't about, you know, uh, do you want me to catch your payment up? Do you want me to take over your loan? Do you want me to do a short sale? Uh, or even do you want to do a loan mod? The question is, how do we stop your foreclosure date uh, now? Because none of us uh, have any deal that we can do if the bank takes the home back. So the techniques for stopping a foreclosure are really, really important so that you have time to work with the homeowner and the homeowner then gets to know, like, and trust you. You know, we had several where we took over, uh, you know, $30,000 loans, um, you know, from the homeowner who did subject to, okay. Uh, and, and the, the, well, the interest rate was like, like 6%. It wasn't very great because the loan was like 15 years ago. But anyway, there was only $30,000 balance on a $200,000 house. Okay. And they let us take over, you know, those, those payments and put a tenant in it. Right. Okay. And they did that because we stopped the foreclosure date. Oh, with those numbers, it'd be very easy just to get a private lender to loan your money and get the bank out of your life anyway. (laughs) Well, well, Ron, and so that, that's exactly what I'm trying to say with short sales. If I've got a house that the loan's $196,000 on it, and I can work with the bank and have them issue an approval letter that lets me buy for $29,600, would I want to take over a $196,000 loan? Or would I rather get a, a private money lender at $30,000? I'd rather do the short sale and get a private lender at $29,600. Versus taking over the 196. That's what the power of a short sale is in this area of creative finance. It's all just math, isn't it, Dan? Yeah. And 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 the banks are dumping the houses, Ron. You know, yeah. I think we talked before. Um, the last four people I worked with each made over a hundred thousand dollars profit on their very first short sale. The banks are dumping the houses because there's one point, let me read the number. 1.874 million delinquent loans right now in this country. And the bank is waiting for you to turn in an offer on the house so they can accept it. Another thing, Dave, I, I got a $150,000 loan balance and I got $50,000 in arrearage. Now, technically, the bank is owed 200 grand. Okay, but they're going to send a BPO out there and that thing's going to come down way, way low. Especially if it needs work, because I like them when they need work, because I know I can get a better um, number on it. But the so the reality is, um, the bank is going to work on the BPO. So the fact that there's fifty thousand dollars in arrearage does not mean that that's going to affect your purchase price when you do a short sale. So that fifty thousand dollars is really not an issue. And yet, I promise you, a lot of people would uh, not buy the house because they see that. Uh, there's so much owed on it, uh, but they forget that uh, the number is going to be based on the value, not uh, not how much the bank is owed. Exactly, Ron. You are so right. Everybody misunderstands that. Matter of fact, it's totally irrelevant what they owe on the loan. Matter of fact, I've been afraid to do a short sale on a free and clear house because I don't ask how much they owe. It's irrelevant because it's all about the bank determining that the actual value of the home is that amount. And it doesn't matter whether the loan is 100,000, 200, 300, or if the arrearages are 50 or 100,000, because 
Exactly right. They're determining what is the marketplace value. And even, but Ron, on top of that, like we said, it's these percentages, okay? Um, and, and if you look at VA, the VA percentage is 85%, okay? Uh, so Fannie Mae is 84.01, and then uh, and then the VA is 85, you know, 0.85. Uh, of that of that valuation and conventional, it could be fifty percent. Okay, so they're they're all working off of Silicon Valley Bank type. Are we going to get shut down? How many non-performing loans do we have? See, that's that's what the it's a fiat currency. If they had a hundred thousand dollar loan and it's not performing, they've got to take one point five million dollars off of their books that they can't lend out to regular people at 7.5%. They'd much rather take $50,000 or $25,000 and then go out and lend $750,000 at 7 or 8%. So it's, so in conventional loans, it, it could be you know any number of the less than the BPO value. And it's irrelevant how much it is owed. Matter of fact, Ron, when they're doing the short sale, the homeowner is not making any payments. They're staying in that house the whole time for free, saving their money up so they can start their life over. And that's what you need to do is, you know, look, Ron, we're, you know we're in the business of helping families out, right? That's what we do. What is their situation? Okay, we're transaction engineers. We're trying to solve the homeowner's problem. And one of those issues is they don't have any money and they can save up their money while you're doing that short sale. Like, I, Ron, I don't really care when I get the house. OK, you know, I rehab five to 10 houses a year. Uh, I don't live in these houses. Right. I don't care when I get them. But every month I get one come off and say, cool. And then I start on that. So it's just just a backlog issue. And so, you know, they can save that money in their own account and then be able to start over new. Patience, Daniel, son, patience. Huh? Exactly. exactly. So you guys ought to take a pencil out right now and write in big, big letters, because I promise you this is going to hear you have to do this several times before it's going to sink in. It doesn't matter what they owe the bank. I mean, that's that's hard to accept. I mean, that's, that goes against everything we know, but it's true. They're going to go by the broker's price opinion, BPO, except FHA is going to go by the appraisal. Um, I'd rather have the BPO to be honest with you, but <laughs> right. no, you're right. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't like FHA short sales because I'm going to pay more money on them. Yeah, well, yeah, but sometimes when they send the appraiser out there, the BPO would even come in higher. So it depends on what appraiser you're going to get. Yeah. So the process from start to finish is going to probably take ninety days or more. Agreed. Yeah, I, the fastest one that I did. Um, I, I wanted to Zoom record the entire thing. And so I did it really fast, as fast as I've ever done it in 13 years. And so it took me two months. It took me two months to do the short sale from start to finish. And it was 22 hours of Zoom recording. So I'm doing the, the listing agreement, the purchase sale, and I'm in my pajamas and I'm on the computer by myself on Zoom, but I'm recording it. And so the whole thing, including the the uh, uh, the BPO at the house, okay, uh, you know, it recorded that. All that was 22 hours, and it was two months from start to finish. Um, for it, um, I could have taken longer by disputing. Um, I bought the house for uh, fifty four thousand dollars, and Ron, I know I could have got it for forty two thousand dollars, but it would have taken another like two weeks to dispute that. Uh, but I wanted to do one as fast as possible. So I bought it for 54, um, two months, 22 hours. I put 30,000 in the house. Okay. Because Ron, remember, I'm I'm a rehabber. I know you don't like those. And oh, I, I didn't say that. Hard. I did not say that. Uh, <laughs> I've done know, a thousand of them myself, Dave. I, I know think. when you're, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, but anyway, Ron, I did a $30,000 rehab. So I bought it for 54, did yeah. a $30,000 rehab and sold it for $220,000. OK, I didn't need to buy it for 42. 54 was good enough. I, I'll have to put that on the spreadsheet, see if that'll work out. But, I, but it, I think, it's a big number. It's a big number. I think it will. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm just beginning and I can barely spell the words short sale. Uh, obviously, I have to start by finding people that are in foreclosure and then probably ought to go back and review this podcast and, and also Maybe you work with you on it. Do you provide any services for them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got a free uh, video that shows you how to find them. Um, you know, 
at, it's a video that I made. It's an hour and a half. It was at a local RIA presentation, and I show you the method of finding them, uh, the website, and the technique um, on there. And that's free to anybody that wants to do short sales. Um, I think the last podcast, you said something about slash Randolph. You know, go there. The mentor podcast forward slash Randolph. Yeah, and they can get that that free video shows you how to how to find uh okay. find short sales. All right. Well, if you would like for me to train you on how to find all kinds of deals on houses, go to ronlegrand.com forward slash terms, and that'll equate you with the terms part of the business that most investors don't know anything about. And that'll be and then ronlegrand.com, there's so much free stuff on there. You spend years trying to trying to consume it all. And then there's always YouTube. Don't forget YouTube. You know, I'm even on TikTok. Can you imagine me on TikTok? Uh, no, I can't. That's a scary. That's scary. I'm on TikTok, I swear. Uh, so it, it isn't hard to find me if you want to learn more from me. So, um, Dave, is there anything that I should have asked you that I forgot to ask you up to this point? Well, no, I mean, I, I just, you know, I'm trying to let investors know that the banks are dumping the houses right now. And so when you're doing the terms with people and they owe too much, don't walk away from those deals, Ron. You know, uh, I mean, for goodness sakes, Ron, have them call me. I'll pay them $2,000 for their dead short sale lead. Okay. So, so you know, you don't want to do a terms deal if they owe $50,000 more than what it's worth. So a lot of investors walk away from those and the homeowner goes to foreclosure and, and that's a, a disservice to the homeowner. You know, um, learn how to do short sales, call me or something. And then I can save that family out of foreclosure, buy the house and make a lot of money. OK, so so, you know, don't let those deals go. We we're transaction engineers. We have to have the capability to do all types of transactions. And and so short sales is just one niche out of your terms area. And the banks are dumping the houses. Just another exit strategy. It's actually, mm-hmm. it's another way to buy a house more than an exit. And I want to put out a warning to all our new listeners that are new into the business. Guys, you can't be going and selling this house before you get clear title to it. You can get a contract, but you can't sell the thing when they're in the middle of a negotiation on a short short sale or or whatever, actually, even a foreclosure that you're trying to stop. I see so many people out there, Dave, they're, they're putting houses on the market to sell that they don't even have a contract to buy. And uh, that is not legal unless you have a real estate license. And even if you do, now you've got to take it through your broker and probably give up some of the profits. So uh, it doesn't take long to figure out what the laws are in the state where you live. But I prefer you figure them out before you get sued or attacked by the attorney general. Uh, and, and then rather than after. Short sales have been around a long time. They're a very valid way to do business, but they do have to have a learning curve. Um, uh, unlikely you're going to get a successful one if you try it and don't even have any idea what you're talking about. So, uh, you're the guy, man. You're the guy. I think doing it for 13 years. And Ron, one last uh, parting comment about that too, that people forget is you absolutely do not need to buy the house in cash. People think you have to, you turn your offer to the bank in cash as is, but I always Ron, come to closing with a lender. Always, you can get a loan on buying a short sale, and people don't understand that. So you don't. A lot of people stay away because well, I don't have the cash to buy the house. You don't need your own cash on a short sale. You turn your offer in saying cash, but you're allowed on any contract to come to closing with a lender. You you know that, Ron? Yeah. What you're saying is, like, if I want to buy it, I can actually buy it with a private lender. Um, but. Um, you got time between the time that they get this mess cleaned up, you still don't have to close the next day. Uh, you, you probably got 30 days after the bank approves the short sale, would be my guess. That's yeah, four, yeah 45 days. We yep, got plenty of time to line up the money, but you also got plenty of time to wholesale if that's what you want to do. Yeah, and Ron, you can you can wholesale short sales. See, it's going to blow. We have to do another podcast. You can short sale. We ought to do one on how to actually find them. Uh, they can go to, uh, you know, to slash Randolph and get that. But, you know, we can do a whole discussion on it. But, you know, um, you know, you. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, we're going to be here for another hour. I'll just stop there. <laughs> uh, I can see it coming, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate you taking time out of your 
work schedule again. Yeah, it's always good to be with you, Ron. Well, we'll probably do another one. We've got plenty to talk about, don't we? Yeah, well, like I said, the, the banks are dumping the, the houses uh, right now. And so, um, you know, and you don't need your money. Um, and, and I guess just to maybe not leave too much of the teaser, I said that you could wholesale a short sale. And here's how that works. It's a double close. OK, so so FHA short sale, you're issued an approval letter. And so you buy it on that day. And as long as you pay for it, you can sell it the same day to somebody else. OK, and in many states, you can use your buyer's money to close on it yourself, but not all of them. So, again, got to find out what the rules are in your state. You said something a while ago that um, uh, you said the bank. When they take back a property, that's a bunch of money. What's the percentage? How many times that amount can they not loan out? 15 times. Yeah, it's this fiat currency thing with the dollar. Fiat well, 15 to 1. I think, unknowingly, you just also made a case that you guys quit worrying about the due on sale clause. Bank has the same problem. Um, and frankly, you see them going out from time to time right now. Banks closing down or getting sold. Uh, when that defaulted ratio goes up beyond the the, the uh, formula that they have from the government, they're in trouble. Like, they got to fix it or they got to sell or they got to close. So um, let's not worry about the internal workings of a bank. But just I can tell you for a fact, they'd rather have COVID than take a house back that they don't have to take back. But of course, if nobody's making payments, they have to take them back. But uh, do on sale clause, you don't need to be concerned about it, especially when you're not guaranteeing any debt or assuming any debt. And that one, I'll beat into them as long as I can say the words. It's the biggest mistake people make in real estate, I think, is guaranteeing debt. And I have about 41 years of evidence to prove it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Ron, definitely. I agree uh, with you completely on that. Um, I mean, banks, you know, are, uh, they, 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 they're in business to collect payments. Why would they stop doing that? <laughs> well, some people think, but there's a bunch of equity in that. They don't want that house. They don't want, I don't care how much equity is in it. They don't want it. Time they got, they buy it and turn it around. That equity is going to shrink down to close to nothing anyway. So, look, Ron, there there would have to be some intelligence at the bank to recognize that there's any equity in the house. Right. You might know there's equity, but there's no intelligence at the bank that would recognize that fact. No. Okay. So no. so <laughs> they anyway, want their payments. My biggest point is they. You know, when you own a when you buy a property, uh, uh, you are in control. The bank's not in control. All the bank can do is call a loan to. All right, and you and you control that process. Now, I don't want to get into that deep as well, but we've got plenty of ways to stop the bank from calling the loan, do just as we do uh, dealing with banks with short sales. Banks do not run your life, and if they do, you probably ought to be changing your business strategy because you're out of control, and all you need is another downturn like another 2008. Ask anybody that went through it, and you don't want to go through it. And um, for those of you who might be thinking, boy, it is really bad. It can't get any worse. Yes, it can. It can get a lot worse. 1982, when I started, the prime rate was 16.8% interest. And yet, by some miracle, I still bought 23 houses my first six months in business. And I really haven't a clue what I was doing. But uh, we got to change with the times. That's all. So the short sales is part of changing with the times. When the rates went way up, that's when owner financing came in big time. Realtors were dropping like flies, but it didn't stop people from selling houses. As long as we live, people are always going to want to uh, sell houses and other people are always going to want to buy them. And if you can get that from your head to your heart, you'll know that it makes no difference where you live. It makes no difference who's president or what the interest rate is or any of those things that we can't control. We can control what goes on in our house so we don't have to worry what goes on in, in the White House. All right, Dave, my sermon is over. Thank Very you. Good. Yeah, thank you, Ron. See you soon. See ya. That's all for this edition of the Mentor Podcast. To connect with Ron and learn how you can attain financial freedom, as well as up-to-date strategies to grow and protect your wealth based on today's discussion, go to www.connectwiththementor.com.